dive into the depths of one of history's most captivating enigmas on tonight's episode on the lost city of Atlantis. Join us as we unravel the fascinating tale of this fabled city, first described by the Greek philosopher Plato over 2,000 years ago. Tonight on Newsworthy, two words and two question marks. Hi, this is Ed Locke with USA Mortgage. Buying your first home can be overwhelming, but here are five tips to make the process go smoother. Number one, find a lender, me, Ed Locke, that can answer any questions you might have and help you get pre-approved. There are multiple options available based on your situation. Number two, work with a real estate agent you can trust. Number three, don't rush the process. Take your time and know that the process could take some time. Number four, consider all the costs. Number five, get a home inspection and review it with your realtor. Keep these tips in mind, budget for yourself, and you'll be that much closer to making your dream of homeownership a reality. So reach out to me at 502-680-0953. NMLS ID 448-908, DAS Acquisition Company, LLC, doing business as USA Mortgage, NMLS ID 227262. This is not a commitment to land. Additional terms and conditions apply. USA Mortgage is an equal housing opportunity. scoured the podcast world and finally found us newsworthy with steve and jerry where we delve into all things mysterious macabre or out of this world and decide if they are truly newsworthy two words and two question marks Jerry, 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 how are you, Mr. Steve? I am great. Yourself? Um, I'm okay. Doing good, man. This is, uh, what, our second actual week on Riverside.fm? That it is. So that whole process went a little smoother. (laughs) A lot smoother than the change last time, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, things happen, unfortunately. Very true. So I was outside just uh, the other day, Monday, I think it was, before the rain. I have a big brush pile. I had a tree come down last year, and they just saved a little money. They just cut it and stacked it by my fire pit as opposed to hauling it off. So I was out cleaning some of that up, and I found a four-leaf clover, Jerry. Really? Yeah. I'd never found one before. I was going to bring it in and, you know, put it in, uh, what's that called when you when you Put plastic around something. What is that called? Putting plastic around something. It's going to bother me now, but it didn't matter. But then I got to looking on the internet and realized I shouldn't uh, use an iron on my four-leaf clover. Why is that? You shouldn't press your luck. (laughs) Wow. Straight into the dad joke today. That was a long way for a really bad joke. (laughs) Really bad joke. Well, I've got one for you. Oh? And I think mine's a little better. Okay. I don't know. It depends on your political taste, I guess, right? Oh, boy. Here we go. Exactly. Exactly. It's going to be some people's cup of tea. Some are going to be like, no, not our life. They're going to dump it in the harbor? Uh, Not quite. (laughs) Don't move. Tea. Harbor. Get it? I get it. (laughs) I don't know if you heard, but the other day there was a traffic jam on I-495. For oh. those not familiar, I-495 is the outer beltway around Washington, D.C., and uh, nothing was moving. And this, I was sitting there, and I saw this guy. He was going down the car, knocking on the window, talking to him for a minute. He gets to my car, and I roll the window down and said, what's going on? He said, terrorists have kidnapped every member of Congress, and they're asking for a $100 million ransom. And they're Ooh. saying, if we don't give it, they're going to cover them in gasoline and set them all on fire. So I'm going from car to car and taking up, you know, collecting donations. And I said, well, how much is people 
how much are people giving on average? He said, about a gallon. <laughs> Woo, go Jerry. That was good. <laughs> yeah. For political jokes, one of the better ones I've heard in a while. Yeah. I don't know of anybody that believes, trusts, thinks. If you're of the, I don't no matter which that. part of you, it are doesn't matter. On. Right, no left. one likes Congress, right? No, like we just we don't like Congress. We don't like. Well, if they would do something that we send exactly. them there to do, it'd be a little different. If they would um, do their job, pretend, even if they would just go up there and leave us all alone, it'd be okay with that. I'm pretty sure. I had a, and we'll get off of this in just a second because we don't do politics here anymore. But um, I was, I saw a meme the other day that I thought was very fitting. What was Back in uh, the Tea Party days, okay. that was a 1% tax on tea. Right. 1%. Average American pays almost somewhere around 76% of every dollar they make on taxes keep at mind, some level. Yeah. You know, it could be a sales tax. It could be a right. tax on an embedded tax on a product. 76 cents on every dollar Americans pay on taxes. The biggest problem with the T-tax wasn't the tax. It was right. the lack of representation, which, which Washington, D.C. still doesn't have. I started to say that there's a group of people in this country that still to this day do not have it. And they proudly tell everyone that will listen. In fact, they put it on their license plates. I'll never it is the motto. That. Yeah. Taxation without representation. Yeah. And they have it. Uh, and it's I, not fair. I understand why. Um, here, here's my thought on that. And I thought a long time, well, that's stupid. You know, maybe we should put some of those folks in, you know, give them representation. But I think because of the way Washington works, because of what it's supposed to, and I'm using air quotes, um, represent, I think it would be better served to go the other way, to remove all their taxes, period. Um, already in Washington... I think you, you have to do one or the other. Yeah, absolutely. You leave it like it is. Right. It's just and, and, and in this particular case, I feel like if you were to put people into power there or give them representation, that could be a, I don't know how to use, use, use my words here, but um, I think that could lead to a lot of corruption and a lot of power, a big power. Huh? How would it be different than? Because of state? proximity to the, to everything. Really? And that's my thought. I, that, that that could be wrong. I mean, I really believe I just, when you compare that to Virginia and Maryland, it, it's hard to explain how that that would be true and applicable for Washington, D.C., and not at all true and not at all applicable for Virginia or Maryland. Also, the citizens of D.C., this is another reason, and I'm just going to be blunt here, but the citizens of D.C. did reelect their mayor who got caught smoking crack in a hotel room. <laughs> So I'm not really trustworthy of their decision making. So let's just not tax them. How about that? Yeah, yeah. To me, I, either one. I, I think it's only fair. I think it's only a matter of time, to be honest with you, before some court system says that it's not constitutional. Oh, and I, how could it be? Right. Well, show me a law in our constitution that says we're going to take this group of people and give them no representation. Right. So obviously, there's no intent of. Congress in the very beginning to do that. It's not mentioned anywhere, but uh, yeah. yeah, you're right. We don't cover politics. Thank anymore, goodness. So let's get what we do cover yeah. is lost cities and lost yeah. civilizations. Yeah, we do. And yeah. one of those that we're going to talk about tonight. Now, you didn't find this com you didn't find this topic very exciting, did you? Not really. I think the evidence is overwhelming. The question, let, let's go back and tell them what we're talking about. Sure, let's sure. not confuse them anymore. We're going to be talking about the lost city of Atlantis. Is it yep. myth or reality? Uh, everyone's heard of it, right? Atlantis, the lost city, the, the city that sunk into the sea. I, I've been to uh, the Atlantis Resort in Bahamas. Beautiful resort. I highly recommend it if you ever get a chance. But, uh, yeah, many books have been written about it. Many movies have been made about it. 
you'd be hard pressed to find anyone that said I've not heard of Atlantis. I would think the vast majority of people probably don't know a lot about it. They probably don't know where the idea first came from. Uh, they just know it to be a very intriguing subject, and it is. No matter what, it absolutely is. But with your comment that I found it to be not as exciting as you, I thought there was I, I thought there was a lot of question about is it myth or is it reality. Most of the research that I did pointed me in one direction, which certainly took away some of the uh, the mysteriousness of it. But uh, that's neither here nor there. So you found it to be very exciting. Why is that? Well, I just I, I've kind of I like to get into it um, a little bit. Um, I'm a so as of the last couple of years. I have started thinking more and more and, and listening to one of the guys that is very big on this is a guy called Graham Hancock. And Graham Hancock is a very likable British guy. Um, seems to know his stuff a lot. He's been on a lot of shows. He's been on Rogue and he's been on um, uh, Ancient Aliens. He's been on all the things. Uh, wrote several books. But he believes that there were, in fact, if not one, but more than one, huge civilizations that were um, inspired, that lived before what was called the Younger Dryas. The Younger Dryas being a small ice age that was the result of uh, what most people think a comet strike. Uh, growing there, the, the argument to that was, well, we don't have any crater to prove that. Very recently, within the last couple of years, we found a crater in Greenland that was buried in the ice that's almost two miles long. Um, with And then the ice that's under the crater is just decimated. It's just broken. And Greenland um, is one of those places that never, uh, it never, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, lost its ice sheet ever. Even in the, you know, when, when most of North America was covered and all that, and then the ice receded, Greenland is, oddly enough, Iceland is very green, and Greenland is very ice-ridden compared to each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, we found that, and that dates to about the time of the Younger Dryad, which was Dryas, which is sometime between 11,800 and 12,800 B.C., a long time ago. Um, but you know, that's anyway, Graham, Graham Hancock believes that Atlantis was real and probably wasn't the only place, uh, that was around before the ultimate destruction that was the, uh, younger dry ass. So, uh, you know, the argument is where's the proof? Where's, you know, we have pottery from the ancient Egyptians. We have, you know, the pyramids, we have whatever. Again, the pyramids, some people are beginning to believe wasn't actually built by the Egyptians, but built by a civilization prior to. I think to. it's fair to say they're beginning to believe. I would say since they were built, people have looked at it and said there's no way mankind can do that. Yeah. With the tools that were available at that time, we still can't explain how that, that was done. We can't even get close to how that was done. Isn't that crazy? That'd be very crazy. Yeah, with all the, you know, we've learned so much. Think about in the last 100 years, just take one profession, medical. If we take the medical profession, what have we learned in the last 100 years? Right. The majority of what we know about medicine, that we've learned in the last 100 years. Go back thousands of years to the pyramids. We still don't know how with the tools that they had in that day and time, we have no clue how they did it. Oh, Jerry, Jerry, if you listen to the experts, the Egyptologist, they did that with a plumb bob. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and thousands of people pushing these big rocks on sticks. Yeah. Now, no, no. one of the things that they have thought about, and this makes even less sense than rolling them on sticks, is that they had channels, they had built channels, they flooded the channels with the water from the Nile, then they used those same sticks and floated the rock down, yeah. and but still had to push them physically up as they built the upward of the pyramid. I just I just can't see it. 
I've seen pictures of what they think it looks like. No, <laughs> I'm not buying it. You can keep whatever it is you're selling. I'm well, not buying. The scientists don't buy it. The scientists. I've never seen them be able to convince scientists that this is possible. Yeah. So, yeah. Crazy. Yeah, but you're right. The problem with a lot of this, whether it's Atlantis or the, and we talked about it before, the possibility of very intelligent civilizations that we have lost along the way. We talked about it during the pyramid. We talked about it in several different episodes. But uh, the problem is that people always say, where's your evidence? And at least with the pyramids, you can say, well, you explain to me how they did this. Right. With Atlantis, it's uh, it's a little harder to come up with. Graham, Han- uh, Graham Hancock is one of the folks that also uh, has advocated mm-hmm. for uh, the Sphinx being way older than what Egyptologists think it is because of the weathering, the water weathering, and the that kind of stuff. So if you've never uh, Googled uh, him or never saw him, by all means, check him out. He's, he's really, really a good, smart fellow. I really like him. So, so he's a big believer in Atlantis. Um, he believes that it's as much a likelihood that it existed, but was destroyed in the younger Jairus as any. Um, and here's the thing. And here's, a, here's the thing that has been you know, sort when, of, when does he think that it existed? Long before, long, a long time ago, prior to Plato, <laughs> way, way before, yeah. From what I understood you to yeah. say, yeah. Okay. Um, but see, that's the whole thing. Plato, I always feel like I'm saying Play Doh, but it's Plato. So Plato used such one of the reasons that this thing has grown and it continues to stick around is which. He described things that as something that you would see. Now, he's an artist. He's a writer. And uh, that's his job. Of of all time. Right. So that's kind of his job to be able to describe something and put it to paper better than most. Right. Um, But even in that, with with some of the things, the the details that he put out, um, that is one of the reasons that it's so believable. And that's why people think it's gone. Was here, not gone. Everybody knows it's gone, but you know what I'm saying. I do. <laughs> and that's not exactly new. Right. Uh, you know, he was the uh, protege of Socrates. Socrates. So Socrates and then Plato and his, uh, the, the next step down was Aristotle. Aristotle did not believe this at all. Aristotle did not think that it was real. He joked for many years about it. Uh, But I'm trying to find it here in my notes somewhere. There was another student, Crentor, another one of Plated students who was said to have believed the story absolutely and even wrote about it. So even in that day and time, it was disputed of whether or not it was real. So Isn't that crazy? That's nothing new. And it's not like we're going to be able to. Shall I g- go ahead and give them the uh, in the suspense? We are not going to be able tonight to 100% prove that it existed or did not. What? Opinions, but yeah, we're not going to be able to answer the age old question with, with little reason. If Aristotle and Crantor, two of Plato's students for, for many years, Aristotle was Plato's students for the last 20 years of Plato's life. And uh, he didn't believe it. But yet, many people at that time did. And still to this day, many people believe it. Crazy. So why don't you tell us why people should believe that the lost city of Atlantis actually existed? Well, I'm not sure that the lost city of Atlantis existed per se, as it said, but We will talk about a few structures and a few places that lead people to believe that it could have. Um, First of all, Plato thinks that it existed somewhere around 10,000 BC, somewhere in that ballpark, I think. Um, No, no, I got my notes backwards. Sorry, that's when the Greenland crater 
came over and the youngest dryad started somewhere 11,000 to 12,000 BC. Um, You're not too far off from what Plato believed as well. Okay. 9,600 years for him. So I wasn't going to correct you. Pretty close. Yeah. Um, and, and that just leads people to believe that these things could have been coexist. Now, if you listen and you you read what Plato said was the Ailey, how do you how would you say Atlanteans? The I people say? of Atlantis. The yes. people Atlantis. of Atlantis. Yeah, um, they were superhumans. They were not as we are today. They were big. He described them as half human, half god. Yeah, demigods. Um, so a couple of the places that we want to talk about. Um, where entire civilizations have sunk under the water. It's happened a couple of different times. Um, In fact, scientists have already found an entire continent that used to connect Africa and Australia that has sunk into the Indian Ocean, (laughs) which is kind of neat. I mean, an entire continent, for for folks to say that can't happen, there is proof that it in fact can happen. And if you go all the way down to Cuba, that's not the picture I wanted to go. Um, (laughs) So I even pulled up a couple of articles about the Younger Dryas and some scientists who are hardcore say that didn't even exist, that it didn't happen. Um, And I'm not sure why, because more and more evidence is showing that, yeah, we did have a pretty big substantial, and it actually helped the humans take over from the Neanderthals, but long story short, oh gosh, there's so much here. (laughs) We're talking about, this is the fun part, because we're talking about a time that was so long ago that we might as well be talking about the same amount of time in the future. We really don't know anything about anything. We're all speculating here. Um, But anyway, uh, one of the biggest, and this this is one for me, Jerry, that um, I, uh, when you look at the Eye of the Sahara, otherwise known as the rickshaw, and I'm probably, the Reichet or the rickshaw um, structure, rishat structure in the Sahara Desert. Have you looked that up? I did not. You should look that up. And it is almost identical to the way in in its build and its structure, if you will, to what Plato said the city of Atlantis looked like. Go ahead and pull that up and look at it. Basically, the city of Atlantis, according to Plato, was a city that was in water, and it was set on many different rings going in with water in between each of the rings and massive, beautiful bridges that connected the rings. Um, the rig shot, if you do a Google view or a Google Earth view of that structure in the Sahara Desert, bears strong resemblance to what the city of Atlantis supposedly looked like to Plato. Um, now, <laughs> yeah, if you just put, put Atlantis into Google, roughly 120 million different things will pop up. So it's kind of hard to get through it. A lot of it is about the place you went to down the Bahamas. (laughs) The resort. Yeah. Um, So here's what Plato said, and I'll quote just a little bit about it. Um, Poseidon carved carved the mountain where his love dwelt into a palace and enclosed it with three circular moats of increasing width, varying from one to three stadia, and separated by rings of land proportional in size. The Atlanteans then built bridges northward from the mountain, making sure the route to the rest of the island. They dug a great canal to the sea, and alongside the bridges carved tunnels into the rings of rock so that ships could pass through the city and around the mountain. They carved docks from the rock walls of the moats, Every passage into the city was guarded by gates and towers, and a wall surrounded each ring of the city. The walls were constructed of red, white, and black rock quarried from the moats, and were covered in brass, tin, or other precious metals, respectively. So, basically, 
the city of Atlantis was a big circle <laughs> with a lot of little circles inside of it. And each, each ring of that was, in effect, guarded by its own walls and its own protections. Pretty cool stuff. Great cool. Yeah. Did you find the rickshot? Yeah. Yeah. See what I mean? How that? I'm surprised I found it because I had no idea how to spell it. But yeah, yeah you just bury it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, while there consensus, uh, or while there is a consensus among, uh, well, let's, uh, there is a consensus about philosophy. Philo, gosh, why can I not say that word tonight? Classicist. Regarding the story's fictional, ficti- my lord, I'm struggling tonight. Fictional character. There is much debate as to what could have served as its inspiration. Plato is very much known to have freely borrowed some of his allegories and metaphors from older traditions, which led a number of scholars to speculate Atlantis was actually inspired by the Egyptian records of the Thera eruption the Sea People's Invasion, or even the Trojan War. Whew, that was a hard statement to get through. <laughs> big words. Huh? Some big words. Big words, yeah. For good old Kentucky boy, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot. Um, others, however, insisted Plato created the entire account fiction, as a work of fiction, drawing loose inspiration from other contemporary events, such as the failed Athenian invasion of Sicily in 415 to 413 B.C., or the destruction of Helike in 373 B.C. You know, the for, Helike actually was a city that an earthquake put underwater. So, back to your original point, this is possible. Yeah. It's, there's nothing that he said, uh, you know, about this place that once existed that now no longer does, that is an impossibility, right? It's just it, it's there's there's a lot here that blows me away. You know what I mean? There's just a lot to it. Uh, I lost my place here. Anyway. Uh, I would encourage anyone to look at the Eye of the Sierra and then compare it to what we just described Atlantis to look at. Now, obviously now, in today's world, the Sahara is a desert. There aren't rings of water around it. There aren't, uh, there is, there's a, a river that flows close to it. But guess what? In 15,000 years, the world changes. <laughs> that it does. That it does. Wouldn't find anyone to dispute you on that. But it is next to a mountain. Just want to throw it out there. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. It is. So what do you think? Tell us about, tell us a little bit about Plato there, Jerry. Well, the reason I'm going to talk quite a bit about Plato is pretty simple. Uh, I agree with everything that you said, basically except the fact that whether or not it existed. Plato described Atlantis and the Athenian, how do you say the word? People Atlanteans. Atlanteans. As a half-god-like people, he described them as half-human, half-god. They were a very technologically advanced society. They had... Uh, huge naval superiority. They were known for their, not just their technological expertise, but they were known, according to his description, it was an ideal society um, in many respects. The, the problem that I have is, and again, like you said, it existed roughly 9,000 uh, years previous. So, in all that time period, why were they never mentioned other than Plato? Why did the entire world forget about the most advanced civilization on the face of the earth? But suddenly, 9,000 years later, one dude has tons of information and, and writes all these accounts of it. No one else, not, not once. 
in recorded history before Plato was Atlantis mentioned. Never no they were scared to mention it. No one, the world had forgotten about it. If it truly existed, the world had forgotten for thousands of years that, that it existed, and suddenly one guy has all the information. Now, what most people believe happened is when Plato wrote about Atlantis, it was in two works. It was Timaeus and Critias. And both of these stories <clears throat> excuse me, were written uh, not as a book, but as a dialogue. They were written as a conversation that was taking place between Socrates, his, his mentor, and Timaeus and Critias, two imaginary fictional people. So when he wrote about this place, he was trying to describe, uh, and he made that pretty clear, he was trying to describe a perfect ideal society. And Atlantis is that. It is this great civilization. These people that were very intelligent. But somewhere along the way, they became uh, greedy. They became consumed with power. And according to the story, that's what brought about their downfall. So in the story that he tells, that, that is briefly introduced in Timaeus and, and predominantly covered in Critias, it is about how that those things can be the downfall of a society. Right. And most people thought that what he was doing was writing this as a warning to Greece, one of the first earliest democracies that the world had ever known. Uh, but he was writing it as a warning that if you don't get your greed un in check, if you don't get the powerful ambitions of some of the politicians in check, God only knows to this day we still haven't solved that problem at all. But his, his point, most philosophers believe that it was his warning, his way of trying to warn society that you cannot continue to let this go unchecked. Keep in mind that, again, he was the student of Socrates. Do you remember how Socrates died, why he died? No. He was tried and executed for perverting the youth. <laughs> Do you know what he did to pervert the youth? Uh, gave them racy cups? He taught them what was happening with the government. He taught them the, the, the problems of the greedy, rich, powerful people. And he was tried, convicted, and executed. So I was like, what's going on? Never mind. We're not political anymore. I agree. <laughs> but can you not see where that Plato would attempt to tell the same story but in metaphors. a way that wasn't going to get him executed yeah no i get that and that's that makes what most sense. philosophers think that he did that he was simply trying to send a warning to the people of that time that look we, we've got a great idea we've got a great concept here this democracy thing is pretty awesome but it can be corrupted it can be corrupted by greed it can be corrupted by these people who uh, are power hungry and that's what most of the people including aristotle at the time thought but if, there, if I had to go back and give you one reason why I do not believe, I can give you two reasons why I do not believe that it was an actual place that existed. Okay. Number one, you mentioned about the continent that we found, and to the best of our knowledge, we have no idea if that continent was even populated. We have no evidence of cities. We have no evidence of people on it. Not that we would have. I'm not saying it was or wasn't. We just don't have any evidence, one way or the other. The Titanic. We were able to find that ship, huge ship. It wasn't a little tiny rowboat. It was a huge ship. We can find the ship. We're talking about a great continent. Do you remember how Plato described it? What did he say the size was? He said it was larger than Asia Minor. Asia Minor is modern-day Turkey and the area surrounding it. He said that it was larger than Asia Minor and Libya United. At the time, Northern Africa was called Libya United. He said it was larger than those two put together. That would be a huge con. Can you imagine? He told us where it was. It was to the west of the Straits of Gibraltar, which is leading into the Mediterranean Sea. So we had a rough idea of where it was to look. And we weren't looking for a small ship. We were looking for a huge continent. And it's never been found. So number one, I think that we would have found it 
if it did exist. Number two, I think history would not have forgotten one of the great races of all time. If these people were the half God, half human civilization that was so far advanced to the rest of the world, and they suddenly ceased to exist, according to Plato, they had they had many people in many throughout the yeah throughout the world. If their homeland suddenly disappeared, I think those people would be raising the alarm. Yeah, I think they would be writing about it. But we have not found of one instance that Atlantis was ever mentioned prior to Plato. So put those two together, I think I would have to agree with most philosophers that it was simply Plato's way of trying to get some revenge for Socrates and to carry on the message that Socrates was trying to spread that ended up getting him killed. So what about the discovery that was made in 2001 off the coast of Cuba? Well, that obviously had to be Atlantis, because that's exactly where Plato said it was going to be. Tell us about it. Well, in the initial discovery, and I'm reading this out of one of your favorite, it's called The Archaeologist, uh, Civilizations of the World. Um, basically, the team of explorers have found what looks to be ruins just off the coast of Cuba. Um these ruins, and let me just read from the actual article for just a second. I, I don't want to take too much out of it because it gets a little wordy. But um, in July 2001, they went back to the location with a senior researcher and geologist, Manuel. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Manuel Ilturd. I, I'm probably butchering his name. I apologize of the Natural History Museum of Cuba. This time they used a remotely operated vehicle to look at and record the structures. Large, eight, roughly 8 by 10 chunks of stone that resembled hewn granite were visible in the photographs. Some of the blocks appear, appeared to be placed on one another on purpose, while others appeared to be left alone. Z Zelitsky stated that it appeared that in the photograph depicted ruins of a sunk, sunken metropolis, though he was hesitated to make any judgments without more information. That new information came... Mm, sorry about that. Uh, according to an estimate, it would have taken somewhere around 50,000 years for stru such structures to be submerged to the depth they were allegedly discovered. Now... By the structures, we're talking about LIDAR-indicated pyramids, round domes, um, many different types of uh, uh, structures as far as um, um, basically a city. You know, it had many different parts of the city, homes, uh, temples, marketplaces, all of them made out of this, this granite, that, which would indicate why it stayed underwater and intact for so long. According to the estimate, it would take 50,000 years for such structures to submerge to the depth they were allegedly discovered. Elta Root continued, as with any cultures that we're aware of 50,000 years ago, there was not the architectural capacity to build such elaborate buildings. A Florida State expert, university expert in underwater archaeology commented, if they are correct, that would be really cool, but it would be very advanced compared to what we would have seen in the New World at that time. The buildings are both out of place and out of time. They're not supposed to be there, but they're there. Um, now, back to Graham Hancock just for a second. The general theory for that they still teach in schools today is that uh, the Americas were populated originally through the Bering Strait. Many, 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 many scientists are coming to full circle on that and saying there's no way possible. In fact, some aspects in the Amazon jungles of South America saying that they were populated in cities the size of London, multiple cities, um, during the same time London was beginning. Um, and several research, or not researchers, but explorers detailed this in their notes. And I didn't write all those down. That's a different topic for a diff different day. But for people to say that we know, let me put it a different way. 
We know more about the moon than we do what's at the bottom of our oceans. <laughs> because at the bottom of the oceans, the pressure and the crush depth, and it's really tough to explore what's at the bottom of the ocean. We're just not meant to be that deep in the water. Um, so I don't disagree with you that, yeah, you know, this is probably a fetch and Plato probably is rolling, you know, he's probably in heaven right now, but <laughs> they're still talking about Atlantis. <laughs> I got them stupid humans. <laughs> but yeah, maybe. Um, there is a lot of opportunity here for um, what could be, I suppose. Well, you started off by saying, what do I think about, then you describe this, uh, what's this archaeological site known as? Uh, I, I don't know if I X'd out of it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, give the name. My, my answer to that would be this. You found a city. Yeah. Where's the rest of the continent? No, that's true. This is a continent. This is a continent larger than Asia Minor and Northern Africa combined. So you found a city. If it has any connection to this, where's the rest of the continent? And if you're talking about in the Bahamas area, there's not room for the rest of the continent to be there. Right. Unless it is part of the Bahamas. Unless if it's part of those part islands. Of the same part didn't yeah. it? But also that would be when you look at when Plato was talking about the interactions that the people of Atlantis had with Greece, with Turkey, with Northern Africa. There's no way we, we did not at that point, unless this civilization was so advanced they had spacecraft, we had nothing that would have enabled them to transverse that distance from Bahamas. Now, we have said we say that, but this was around the same time that Eastern Island was created. And Eastern Island, they say they got, those fellas got there to Eastern Island we on freaking no canoes. We have no idea <laughs> how they got there. So many questions about Eastern Island. Right. Which is a, another show for a different day. It is. But, again, I want to go back to something. You mentioned jokingly that, uh, Plato is probably in heaven going, oh, they're still, you know, making fun of the people that are still talking about it. He Including us. He obviously did not want to get rid of the uncertainty. Two of his own students, two of his brightest, most well-known students, Aristotle believed for the rest of his life that it was entirely made up. He had an ongoing joke that he told about how Plato could conjure great nations and describe them in great detail and then destroy them in an instant. That was a joke that he told. But other students of Plato's believed wholeheartedly that Atlantis was real. So obviously for us to try to determine when his own students were at odds, yeah, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> well, Jerry, Atlantis, do you think it deserves more or less news coverage? Is it newsworthy? Anytime that we have a question this large, whether physically the size of a continent or just philosophically, um, if you believe that that's what Plato was doing, was trying to answer some philosophical questions, that has been disputed for this many thousands of years it absolutely needs more coverage absolutely i agree two thumbs up from us here at newsworthy that was an interesting episode but our journey isn't over yet if you stay tuned we have an exciting bonus story coming up after this commercial break hi this is ed lock with usa mortgage when it comes to buying a home the process can be overwhelming and confusing with so many options it can be hard to know where to start that's why it's important to work with a certified mortgage loan originator. I have the knowledge and expertise to guide you through the process and find the best mortgage option for you. I will work with you every step of the way to ensure that you are getting the best deal possible. So if you're looking to purchase or refinance, please reach out to me at 502-680-0953. So don't take on the stress of buying a home alone. Work with me and I will make your dream a reality. Trust the professionals and make your home buying experience a positive one. MLS ID 448908, DAS Acquisition Company, LLC, doing business as USA Mortgage, MLS ID 227262. This is not a commitment to lend. Additional terms and conditions apply. USA Mortgage is equal housing opportunity.
If you would like to share suggestions for future episodes, an intriguing ghost story, or simply tell us how much you love or hate us, please get in touch with us. You can reach us via email at newsworthywithstephencherry at gmail.com or send us a text at area code 540-709-1318. And now, back to the story. Jerry, we go from a place tonight that we have no idea if it existed to a place that we absolutely know existed, and you can go visit it today. Nice. The Valley of the Mills in Sorrento, Italy. At some point during the 13th century, the people of Sorrento found an ingenious excuse me, use for a deep ravine cutting through the area. Flour mills were built at the bottom of the chasm, where a steady stream of flowing water could help power the grounding mechanisms. Sawmills would later follow, and the narrow canyon would buzz with the sound of commerce all the way all, from then all the way to the 1940s when the last mill was finally closed. Since then, the abandoned mills seemingly have sprouted their own ecosystem. Ferns, holly oak, and ash trees have gradually enveloped the entire stone the entirety of the stone buildings. The Valley of the Mills, in all its overgrown glory, became a draw for artists and photographers. In 2019, a controversial project began to clear out all the vegetation and restore the mills that we see in our images. Those, and those who simply love the mysterious beauty of the untouched ruin, are working very, very hard to keep get that clean up all Halted. Woo, that was tough to get through. <laughs> but so far, they've stopped all of that, and they are re-letting the, the vegetation take over. And if you go to Bing or any of these sites to see this, it's a beautiful site, and you can understand why they didn't want it to be all cleaned out. It's awesome. Absolutely. And, Jerry, if you can't see the light, be the light. 